member organizations. Um, we also we, we try to bridge uh, or create a bridge between these member organizations and the technology sector. So we're about what can technology do for international development. Uh, personally, I run a uh, website called the Nairob Solution Center. I'll uh, do a little shameless plug for that a little bit later also. It's solutioncenter.nairob.org, where we talk about how technology uh, helps achieve uh, objectives in international development and, and conservation. Uh, today, we're, we're going to talk about uh, the, the Vodafone um, Wireless Innovation Project uh, winners. We're going to cover the 2015 and 2016 winners, and we have a lot of information to share with you. So I'm going to get out of the way really, really quick, and uh, just very quickly introduce the, the panelists here, and then we're going to have them just uh, walk through their individual sessions, and uh, we hope to have a little time at the end for some question and answers and, uh, and discussion. So uh, at the end of the table here, we have uh, Cody, Cody Finke, is it? Is it? Yep, that's yeah. right. Uh, with Caltech, and uh, he's going to talk about his uh, sanitation solution. Uh, we have Richard uh, from MIT, Richard Fletcher, uh, talking about his uh, mobile stethoscope and uh, mobile uh, application um, for doing diagnostics with that, it's exciting technology. All of these are incredibly fantastic and interesting technologies. Uh, we have Tim from Well Done, uh, he works for Arch Systems right now, uh, but he's going to talk about uh, his mobile monitor systems for uh, water flow and, and uh, what have you. Um, then we over on the other side we have Sona uh, Shah. She's with uh, Neo Panda. Is that the way you pronounce that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she uh, is going to work uh, talk to us about a, uh, a vital sign monitor for babies and with uh, uh, incredible uh, potential uh, to solve uh, relatively simple uh, problems in a in an early stage of life, so that's going to be interesting to hear. Uh, and Amid uh, is with IC, and he's going to talk to us about his vision enhancement, uh, enhancement and tele-rehabilitation uh, solution. And last but not least, we have Steve Fang, and he's going to talk about a uh, air monitoring solution that uh, certainly, you know, just as we had uh, the announcement today about the 200 or so nations that uh, signed the agreement in uh, uh, Rwanda about uh, you know the fluorocarbon uh, uh, all that I think it's very appropriate what you're going to talk about later on today so with that I'm just going to get out of the way I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Cody so go ahead Cody. This is my yep one is great. Okay yeah so I, I am Cody Finke um, from the California Institute of Technology and I'm a PhD student there I work on uh, solutions for the sanitation crisis in the developing world. So I've probably done too much background in this crowd about the sanitation crisis, but um, as you guys probably know, there's over 4 billion people who lack access to treatment systems that adequately treat their wastewater. Um, it causes huge human health problems, huge environmental problems, huge water scarcity problems, huge economic problems, the list goes on and on. Um, so we want to develop um, sort of a Holy, holistic and applicable technology that can work in um, areas where there, aren't, where there isn't infrastructure. So that's um, something that you can assume about most of the developed world, um, or essentially assume. So these are um, treatment systems that treat wastewater on site and then recycle that wastewater to minimize the demand for water. So we have an electrochemical technology, um, and here's a little diagram about how it works. It essentially, um, kill, it uh, functions without adding anything but electricity, um, to uh, create reactive chlorine species from chloride that's naturally found in urine, and to completely kill off pathogens, clarify the water, sterilize the water, remove um, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and macropollutants. Um, so this water is fit for uh, putting back into the environment, and it is also um, recycled. So, and there's an input of water every time someone uses the bathroom, so our lease system is a surplus of water. So it's, great for health issues, environmental issues, and water scarcity issues. Um, something that's not great about is something that um, most, we found with most technologies, um, high-tech solutions to problems in the developing world is that it breaks. Um, and when it breaks, just like anything breaks, it doesn't really get fixed. Um, and this is a problem in the developing world that technologies don't get fixed and they just turn to junk. 
Um, but we wanted this technology to actually work um, for the long term to treat this problem. Um, so we wanted to develop a solution, and that's this mobile technology we're talking about. So here's just a little graph, um, and all these times there's a little star around here. Um, so I guess what this graph is, is this is when a treatment system is working, um, it is anytime those red or blue lines are up, and then when what red or blue lines are down towards the um, x-axis, the treatment system is not working. And um, the previous solution was one of the engineers had to go fly out to the developing world and fix it. It's not a very sustainable solution. Um, so we wanted to make a technology to allow local people who may have almost no access to education or no educational background to fix this. So one thing that we know is that um, the, there's about 98 mobile phones for every, or mobile phone subscriptions for every third people in the world. So you can rely on, there's reliably a skilled mobile phone operator just about anywhere in the world. Um, so we just decided we would try to create um, sort of an app for one of these Huawei uh, inexpensive smartphones um, that uh, is hooked up to a series of sensors that's on our way to our treatment technology so that um, the technology itself can tell when it's broken and how it's broken, and then you can get the app to um, just inform someone tutorially how to replace the part that's broken. Um, these parts, the, sim the system is really simple, these parts can all be replaced um, just by using a screwdriver to unscrew the old part and re then screw in the new part. Um, we found this to be, um, in, in initial testing, a reasonably um, effective way to get people who know nothing about the system but know how to use a mobile phone to be able to replace the system. And we um, have seen that you know, our technologies um, are able to be fixed without us having to go there. So yeah, so just a little quick thank you to all the people who have helped us, including Bone of America's Foundation, Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, we work with extensively on um, our field sites, and the rest of the institute. And I'll pass it off to the next person. Good morning, uh, I'm Rich Fletcher, I'm from the Mobile Tech Lab at MIT, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a uh, health project that we're doing, specifically for pulmonary disease diagnostics and screening. So pulmonary disease is a very large burden throughout the world, and in India and South Asia is particularly large. Uh, uh, pulmonary disease includes many diseases that, that you might have heard of, such as COPD and asthma, some pneumonia. Uh, in particular, for example, COPD alone it accounts for a large, uh, like it's a third leading cause of mortality around the world. Um, in India in particular, it's a particularly large need because uh, there's not only few doctors, but even among the doctor population, there's very little expertise in diagnosing pulmonary disease. So how do you traditionally diagnose pulmonary disease? Well, the lungs are composed of different uh, uh, chambers and different parts of uh, airways. And these are characterized uh, medically using generally fairly expensive machines. Using uh, these are called pulmonary function testing labs, and there's only a few dozen of these throughout the whole country of India. So very few people actually get to be diagnosed through these, uh, you know, gold standard methods. And there's standard protocols for um, using these machines to tell you exactly what's wrong with your lungs and which disease you have. But in low resource settings, as, as many of you know, there's very little equipment to, to use. So for this need, for this reason, we developed a mobile kit, which is uh, not only low cost, but has a simplified protocol. And this consists of three parts. And here on the slides, you can see we have one part that's a mobile stethoscope, another one which is a peak flow meter, and a last one which consists of a questionnaire. And we've also developed a protocol that goes around this, which I won't describe in detail, but it, it allows you to screen for a variety of pulmonary diseases. So the first, the first of these parts of the kit is the mobile stethoscope, and we've developed an app that goes with it, as long, uh, along with a, a very simple stethoscope that plugs into a phone. This guides the, the, the clinician or the health worker to record data, and then we do some machine learning analysis uh, to classify different types of lung sounds and listen for abnormal lung sounds. And using this, we've gotten uh, reasonable results of uh, being able to detect abnormal lung sounds and also classifying them. The second part of the kit is uh, the peak flow meter. And unlike a spirometer, which is very difficult to administer, 
Um, this is a very simple device, very low cost. Many of you may have used it if you've had asthma or allergies uh, and have gone to the doctor. So the innovation here is we use augmented reality, so there's no electronics. Just by putting a sticker on the device, you can uh, blow into the device, the patient blows into the device, and then you point your mobile phone camera at it, and it records a reading and also provides some, some uh, feedback for, for the patient, as you can see in this slide here. So it tells you what range you're in, if it's uh, you know, red, yellow, or green, if you're in a good range or bad range, for example. And then the third thing we add is a questionnaire, and then we put all this information together into an algorithm, and it allows us to do screening and diagnostic prediction. So um, using the data that we've collected over the past year and a half, um, these are some of our results. So we have a multi-level um, machine learning classification. The first one is just to distinguish between healthy and non-healthy. And then within the unhealthy group, we then do an additional layer of classification to see whether you have an obstructive or, or non-obstructive disease. So, so non-obstructive might be like allergies. So, so we're trying to distinguish, do you just have allergies or do you have something more serious or chronic like asthma or COPD? And then within the obstructive group, we then classify either asthma or COPD. Uh, these studies are being done throughout uh, a few different sites in the Maharashtra state within India and um, some of the funding and support for our research. Uh, this uh, Vodafone grant has allowed us to do 500 patients and we just recently got an NIH grant to do another 500 and expand the study to other diseases to include pneumonia, TB, lung cancer, and interstitial lung disease. And the, the Tata Trust uh, in India has also been generally uh, generously supportive of our program and has given us two graduate students for our study. And that's about it. Or maybe we'll take questions later. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Burke. And what I want to talk to you about today is a little different from what uh, some of the panelists have been talking about. So let's say you work for a nonprofit and you put in, you dig wells, um, say in Southern Africa, and you want to provide clean water. So on, with a global average, you probably have about a 40% chance that the well you dug within six months to a year will have broken down and no one will actually get clean water from it. And so you say, okay, I want to be able to monitor when my well breaks down. So I want to have sort of a little device, think like a smart water meter, I could put on my well and it would text someone, a repair person, or maybe myself, maybe someone in the government, the actual responsible person would vary in the context, and it would be able to reward me when it breaks down, maybe it would add predictive maintenance, sort of things that people are starting to do more in, in industrial context, in factories, doing logistics tracking, doing um, failure analysis. And you want it to be really cheap, right? A well might cost you know, between two and 10, maybe a little bit more thousand dollars. So this device needs to be very inexpensive, and you think it should be, right? I can buy a cell phone for $10. I can buy maybe a water flow meter for $15, $20. I put them together. I should be able to make a cellularly connected flow meter for $35, $40. And so the goal was, can you do it for $100? Uh, maybe you put some margin in there for a company to actually make these and make a little bit of profit and, and pay their staff. And we found you couldn't. Found that there's not a product on the market that was cheaper than $800 for this device. And $800 was too expensive. No one's going to install it because you can install an entirely new well some places for those as those two grand. And so we started looking into this and figuring out you know, why is it so expensive. And we came into this fundamental problem. Like these are sort of highly customized, low volume devices, which means they're expensive not because they're expensive to make, they're expensive to design. Right? Like the reason why that cell phone is ten dollars is because you're making tens of millions of them. And so all the money you spend paying engineers to design it. You know, that's a fraction of a cent per device. If you're only making 5,000 of something or 10,000 of something per year, you know, that engineering time is comparatively much more important and very expensive. So average number is you spend maybe $300,000 designing a new sort of wirelessly connected product. And it only costs you 20 bucks in materials to make each one. But if you only make 10,000 of them, you never get past that first initial sort of non-recurring engineering expense. And that's what we really focus on. Um, we have this concept what we call interchangeable parts for remote sensing. We're able to help nonprofits and also for-profit companies as part of our model. Um, we have standard libraries of sensors, like a water flow sensor, 
cellular communication, other kinds of communication, Bluetooth to your phone, depending on what you need, um, that are all designed to work together so that you don't need a complex engineering team to build this product. You go to our website and you say, I want this sensor, I want maybe that actuator, I want it to connect over cellular, I want to put it in a waterproof box, and I want it to attach to my well. And then we're able to combine all those things together from parts we already have and build you a product that does exactly what you want. Like that water sensor with a lot of overhead, the last one a battery for as long as you need. Um, but the key difference is we didn't have a team designing it for you, so we didn't incur $300,000 of expense for your product, which means we can sell it much closer to that $20 than to the $100. And so right now what we do is we have a for-profit company, our systems, that takes this technology and uses it for industrial clients domestically, and then a non-profit organization, Walden International, powered by the same core technology, which then gets to piggyback on the innovation on the for-profit side to use them for global development. Thank you very much. sharing a little story about um, when I was in Uganda last month. So in this special care baby unit, there were 80 critically ill babies and only three nurses to actually help care for them. So as I'm sure you can imagine, newborns in distress often went unnoticed. And uh, while I was there, a baby named Josephine was admitted with severe birth asphyxia and hypothermia. But they didn't have anywhere to put her because there were already two or three babies in the incubator. So they literally left her on a plastic chair and they left her there for about an hour before they could even attend to her. Um, so this, this was really sad and unfortunate, but um, what's really surprising is that Josephine's story is actually not unusual because 46 million newborns need care for complications that happen at or around birth. And of those, three million babies are dying every year. And the WHO estimates that 80% of those deaths are actually preventable if you can recognize a baby in distress quickly enough and be able to provide the appropriate treatment. But the problem is that in these low-resource hospitals, there isn't an efficient way to identify when newborns are in distress. So we thought, what if there's a way to identify these newborns so that nurses can go in and give appropriate treatment? And that's exactly what we've done. So we've created a wearable vital signs monitor that measures four different vital signs heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, all integrated into a little baby hat. This is just a model, but to give you an idea of what it looks like. So the vital signs from multiple newborns wirelessly communicate with a single tablet so you can efficiently be able to evaluate the health status of all of the babies in the room just from one screen. So I, I, I've met a lot of uh, students at this conference, so I wanted to walk through what our milestones have been, and I apologize, I know that's really small, so I'll, um, I'll just talk through it, I think that'll be better. So we started in January of 2015 uh, when we were students at Columbia University. So we were studying in a biodesign class that essentially walked through the entire process of identifying a problem in need, identifying stakeholders and interviewing them, and then creating an initial prototype. So after this class, um, we got some initial funding that we used to actually travel to Uganda, and that was really important for us because we really saw what it was like in these hospitals, and we wanted to evaluate is what we're creating actually needed and something that they would use there. And overwhelmingly, uh, the answer was yes, even in the nicest private hospitals, they didn't have any continuous vital signs monitors. <laughs> so uh, after we got back, we participated in an accelerator program. We raised some initial funding, um, including Photophone. And now we have finalized our prototype that we'll be using uh, in our first pilot studies in Uganda early next year. So our immediate next steps from here are to test the accuracy and impact of our device in Uganda, and then start selling the devices in January 2018. Um, so this is our team. We're a team of two engineers. I have experience working both in developing countries and in the healthcare industry, and my co-founder, Teresa, is also a biomedical engineer leading our technology efforts. 
Um, but I just wanted to thank our advisors and all of our partners at this point, just because uh, without them, we wouldn't have been able to, to help save babies. Um, and with that, we hope that you join us in the fight to reduce newborn mortality, and I'd love to answer any questions later. Thank you. School. I am delighted to be on this panel today going over Project IC. Uh, so IC is a mobile assistive technology for people with low vision, specifically hemianopic stroke patients. Uh, I'm going to go over what hemianopia is. Uh, hemianopia is a major cause of disability. It's basically the blindness or impairment of vision in half the visual field, primarily as a result of strokes, and to a lesser extent from tumors or trauma. Uh, here I'm showing an example. This is the southern border of UCLA. Hemianopic patients as drivers, they are missing out on a lot of things. So, they do not see the periods that's making a left. Uh, they do not see the uh, arrow light. And there are a couple of pedestrians, if you notice, to the left of the image. They do not see those pedestrians. And the situation is equally scary when they want to walk and cross the street. So hemianopic patients, as, pedestri as a pedestrian, uh, they do not know what's happening to the side, to the affected side. Is it a car coming? Is it someone bumping into them? Etc. Etc. Uh, so the problem statement is every two seconds, someone in the world has a stroke. Unfortunately, one in three dies, and among the survivors, one in three has hemianopia, developed hemianopia right after the stroke. The Bad news is that the number of strokes is increasing. It's going to double by year 2030. What's the reason? There are two reasons uh, they are actually related to each other. One is the aging of the population, and the second one is the improvements in the emergency care for stroke patients. There are less stroke death these years, and as a result, there are more people that survive and therefore there are more hemianopic patients. So here is our solution I see, is a vision enhancement and vision rehabilitation solution based on mobile technology. So we combine a smartphone and a head-mounted display such as Google Glass, Music M100, or a couple of other platforms. And to the left, you see how it works. So uh, the patient, through his or her smartphone, decides how much extra vision he or she wants. And accordingly, the head-mounted display, it remaps the pixels of a camera that's, keep, that's keeping recording images. And in other words, it projects the images to the still-functioning parts of the visual field. So, in this example, the user of our system, I see, can avoid bumping into people while he's walking uh, in a park. And to the right is the rehabilitation part of Project IC. The head-mounted display could be connected directly to a low vision expert, A, for the subject to receive instructions on how to properly use the device and B, to perform standard testing and getting better and better, becoming more aware of the environment in which they are uh, living in. So here I have a little example showing how it works. Uh, this is not the best quality video, but it's gonna give the message. So this scenario is walking in a hallway 
the left part of the visual field is missing. However, the head-mounted display is taking care of that. So if someone is uh, coming out of an office or a room, the patient is going to notice them and is going to avoid bumping into them. And you could imagine you know, other applications with uh, indoor navigation, etc. So this project, we are right now doing phase one clinical trials. We are 40% done. Uh, we are planning to recruit 30 hemianopic patients, uh, which is a hard task because we want these patients to solely have hemianopia and nothing else no other condition that could affect uh, their walking patterns, their navigation patterns, no learning disability, the list is very long. So, so far we have had five patients, one of which is a student of mine, and they have all seen and experienced improvements right after using the device with just 30 minutes of training. So in long term, our goal is to improve the quality of life for stroke hemianopic patients and help them get back their independence. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention, for which I'm grateful.